Hello, and welcome to Physical Attraction. This episode, we have a guest on the show that I'm very excited about. Professor Steve Keen is an economist and author who has been a long-standing critic of neoclassical economics, which has included writing the best-selling debunking economics book and hosting the podcast of the same name, predicting the 2007-8 financial crisis several years in advance, as well as developing several alternative models of the macroeconomy. In recent years, he has turned his attention to how neoclassical economics has tried to deal with the issue of climate change. And while the fact that his paper is called The Appallingly Bad Neoclassical Economics of Climate Change probably tells you something about how he has found their response. I was lucky enough to detain him for the interview for quite a while, so I've had to split the interview into two parts. They complement each other, but they can be listened to independently, depending on what you're most interested in. Although, of course, I would say listen to both. The first part deals with Professor Keane's background, his critique of neoclassical economics, the parallels and differences between economics and physics as disciplines, and little about financial crises and possible steps we could take to deal with the economic fallout of COVID-19. The second part dives deep into the critique of neoclassical economics of climate change, specifically how economists have consistently been overconfident in their projections of climate damages and arguably helped lead us towards weak climate policies, and how we might hope to change this in the future. Now, I think this is an incredibly important message and a subject that we need to discuss and debate, because unfortunately, this neoclassical economics of climate change has been extremely influential on policymakers, to the point where one of the main culprits has the so-called Nobel Prize in Economics. So I really do urge everyone to listen to that. Without further ado then, the interview. Hi, so first of all, Professor Keane, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show and all your work on economics. We're going to discuss the economics of climate change and your work on that subject more specifically later on. But to start with, I think it will be helpful to talk about your perspective on economics more broadly. So you've got a podcast, you've got a book, Debunking Economics, and throughout your work for many years now, you've levied a substantial critique at neoclassical economics. Would you like to talk about your background as an introduction and how you came to that critique of economics as the sort of mainstream practices it at the moment? Oh, I began as a a complete believer in mainstream economics. I I, I mean, my age matters here. I did uh, my high school in 1969 and 1970. And the textbooks we were using at high school were the equivalent, or actually more than the equivalent of the textbooks used in universities these days. You know, I came in the top, uh, whatever it was, 50 or so at economics at, uh, in the higher school certificate and uh, had an ambition of becoming an you know, academic economist or professional economist. I didn't even realise that I could become an academic at the time. I wanted to combine economics with engineering, which wasn't, uh, there was no such combined degree. The only combined degree was arts and law. And that's what I was advised to do, which I majored in economics while doing mathematics and psychology as well in my arts degree. And um, so I was being trained in very, very high quality mathematics course. Uh, so I was learning mathematics at an extremely good standard uh, while sitting through lectures on, macro, uh, on, on mathematics for macroeconomists or economists uh, in my first year and being horrified at how simplistic the mathematics was and how it was taught. The Sydney University was in quite a stage of format at the time where, where students were being conscripted to go and fight in Vietnam. Uh, in fact, the only way you could avoid uh, fighting there was A, being lucky in a ballot, but B, uh, you could, if you were unlucky, then you could say, I'm a student and have your conscription delayed until after you graduated. I never took advantage of that, but that gives you, you can imagine the level of protest on campus over the Vietnam War was comparable to the sort of protest you saw in the States, though without the military response, the States threw back at the students. Um, so I was quite conservative when, that, uh, when my um, year began, uh, but the only thing I was troubled about was why am I being conscripted to fight for freedom? So that was sort of an intellectual background there. And then in my first year, there, there, there had been, I wasn't aware of this at the time, there was had been a very progressive humanist style economics course until about 1968. And then at that time, the, the then head of uh, the then vice chancellor, Bruce Williams, who was himself a professor of economics from, from uh, Manchester University in the UK, he uh, arrived in, in, uh, in Sydney University, uh, didn't like the course, thought it was too wishy-washy, appointed two very neoclassical professors to take it over. And in the middle of, uh, I think it was 69, they imposed a, a very uh, conventional microeconomic oriented, uh, general equilibrium style macro uh, course on the staff against their will and uh, against the will of the students as well. So there'd been 
that sort of revolt going on for some time. And one of the staff they appointed, who was also another British uh, emigre, uh, Frank Stilwell, had done his PhD and become a critic himself while writing his PhD. And in the middle of first year, he taught us what's called the theory of the second best. Now, this is something which if you did learn it, uh, you'd learn it normally in your honours year or your master's course or that sort of thing. And if you got that far by that stage, you simply took it as an interesting wrinkle on the surface of neoclassical economics. But what Frank did was show that applying this very conventional, very you know, well-credentialed mainstream economic theory, uh, that it said you know, the, 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 the nirvana for economists was perfect competition everywhere, including in the labor market. So you had, you know, have workers, individual workers competing with individual firms, and that would set a competitive wage, which maximizes welfare for everybody, uh, worker and capitalist alike. And then what Frank did was using this theory of the second best, show that what if you take, if you start two steps from this nirvana, if you have monopoly or organized um, manufacturer uh, uh, employers facing uh, organized labor, what happens if you eliminate one or the other? And the answer was categorically, you made the situation worse. And I remember thinking, what the hell's going on here? Because, you know, in, in half an hour, applying mainstream, not, not mainstream so much, but it's uh, something which had been published by the mainstream journals, uh, you suddenly put a hole in the argument that perfect competition was, was, the, was an ideal because, you know, if you were two steps away and you tried to get one step closer, you made the world worse, not better. I thought there's got to be something wrong with the textbook. So I checked the textbook. There was no mention of this um, issue at all in the textbook. It was actually, and then I thought, well, there's got to be something in the journals. So I made my first ever trip to the library to look in, in economic journals. And then I found what was called the Cambridge Controversy Debates, uh, which an Australian economist, uh, Jeff Harcourt, had had a major hand in as it happens. And this were disputes between two, the two Cambridges, Cambridge in the uh, UK and Cambridge, Massachusetts, MIT over whether you over effectively over the neoclassical theory of income distribution, and uh, in the middle of it, 1966. This is five years before I um, uh, was doing my studies. There was Paul Samuelson admitting he lost in a paper called a summing up, and here he conceded that the critics were right. You couldn't, you can't measure capital in such a way that it's independent of the rate of return in a neoclassical model, and therefore there is no justification for the marginal productivity theory of income distribution, which was an essential component of the overall theory. And I was horrified. I thought, what's going on here? This is mendacious. And I became a critic from that point on. And then the more I explored and, and, and I gave up on the journals, I, on, the, on the textbooks rather, uh, I began uh, li living in the journal section at the library at the time. And I had the mathematics to handle any of the any of the papers I was reading because first year university mathematics was a higher standard than most academic papers. Um, and I I just realised there's this enormous critical literature, both empirical and theoretical, that's completely ignored by the mainstream. Uh, we're getting a mendacious education, and that is just you know, anti scientific. I mean, it's interesting. So, so my I'm a physicist. Uh, my twin brother studied economics. And the sense that I get from it from him and from other people who I've spoken to is that when you study an economics course these days, the mainstream, obviously, um, there's a whole bunch of idealized assumptions that you make. And you're always expecting at some point that the veil will be lifted and that we'll stop making these extremely idealized assumptions that, you know, clearly we know don't apply in reality. Like, for example, you talked about uh, the idea of perfect competition amongst individuals who are all competing with each other. And that many of these models don't even have a, a, a coherent way of dealing with a firm, a company where people are acting together um, and all this sort of thing. And you sort of, you go through the course and you expect, okay, well, this is just the simplified version of it. Eventually, um, as as one would do in science or physics, for example, we'll, uh, we'll take away some of these assumptions. We'll show you how to add in friction. We'll show you how to deal with the relativistic case and all this sort of thing. Um, but in economics, it just doesn't happen. And you end up with these models, which keep all of these, uh, very idealized assumptions in. And and what, what what it sounds like you're saying to me is that the literature is sort of aware of all of these flaws. You know, you can go into the literature and find out plenty of people taking issue with this. Um, but then when it actually comes to doing economic analyses, um, this stuff just 
this this theory um, that is quite unwieldy and flawed is just still used as if these flaws weren't there? No, it, it's well, it's, it's partially accurate. I mean, you will find the flaws in the journals, but what you find are flaws that are, are points at which anybody sane should have said, this is nonsense, uh, throw this paper out, don't continue. Uh, but instead, they do continue. So... Uh, and so you, you, you won't. You, what you'll find is that the, there will be some outrageously stupid, categorically false, uh, and and not just that significant assumption. This is the point they they pretend their assumptions are simplifying. Their assumption is actually critical. If the assumption is false, then so is the theory. Uh, so that you'll find an assumption made like that in the literature, and then what happens when the textbook gets to it? They will either ignore that assumption and just give you the the bland, you know, bland result, or they will. Um, um, soft pack the assumption so it sounds halfway reasonable when in fact it's outrageous. So like my, probably my favourite in the whole thing is if you, if you, you look at a, a typical economics textbook, uh, you've got that uh, what, what a, a brilliant paper called Life Among the Econ by uh, the critical economist Axel Leinhofer called the totem of the econ, uh, a pair of intersecting lines, one label supply and the other label demand. Um, well, essential part of that is this argument that uh, uh, that supply, uh, the, the cost of production rises as output rises. Now, starting in the 1930s, economists began to uh, liaise with business people to see if they, there could be benefits both ways, academics talking to practitioners, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Um, and when they actually explained, when the economists explained what their theories were, that the manufacturers were incredulous. It just doesn't describe the cost structure at all. And then uh, when, when they started doing, economists started doing surveys, they found that the cost of production for most corporations, like it is in 90, 95% of companies and products, declines with output. So rather than what neoclassicals um, talk about as an essential concept, which they call diminishing marginal productivity, uh, if you look at the cost of producing each additional item, it was either constant or falling for 95% of firms. No, not economies of scale. Simply the fact that engineers design factories. Uh, if, you, if you're an engineer and you've got a factory to build, uh, you will design it so it works at its maximum efficiency when it's virtually at maximum capacity. Now, their assumption was instead that uh, there's, you, you have what they call fixed capital. So you have a, a bunch of machines, uh, which is your fixed capital, and then your variable input is labor. And effectively, the neoclassicals aren't even aware they're doing this, frankly, but what they assume is each worker you hire uh, is charged, is spread across all the machines in the factory. So that if you, if you have like the, if the ideal ratio is like you know, one, one worker per machine, so let's say our machine is a jackhammer, um, then you start with a, with a factory to build roads, which has a thousand jackhammers. Your initial model has that one worker managing a thousand jackhammers. Um, and then you get to the point where you have one worker per jackhammer, and that's your ideal ratio, and that's where you get your minimum overall production cost. That's the bottom point of the uh, uh, the, the cost curve, uh, per unit cost curve. And then when you increase output, you certainly have you know, ultimately two and three and four workers on each jackhammer. Now, that's, that, that is total nonsense. Um, so, so what you get instead is in, in proper manufacturing, there's an ideal ratio of, uh, of labour to machines, and that's what you employ per machine. And you then vary your capacity. You, you, if you have a, if you have a, you know a thousand machines, and you've got enough capacity uh, demand to hire five hundred of them, then you leave five hundred idle and work the other five hundred at full capacity. And therefore, when you when you expand your output, you are not facing diminishing marginal productivity at all, um, and you therefore have a constant or falling marginal cost. Now that's that there must be there's at least twenty surveys of that nature, the literature. And the last one was done in the in the 1990s by Alan Blinder, who was a, a leading, a prominent neoclassical. He was a vice chairman of the Federal Reserve and a vice president of the American Economic Association. So you don't get much more mainstream than Alan Blinder. And he, uh, he belongs to what they call the New Keynesian strain. The neoclassicals divide themselves in macroeconomics into what they call new classicals, which aren't classical, and new Keynesians, who aren't Keynesians, but that's their terminology. <laughs> And they abuse each other. One, one bunch abuses the other. I call them neoclassical. It gets really comical when you get deeply inside the, uh, the clan. Um, but they, so, so this is a guy whose work um, relied upon the idea that prices are sticky. To some extent, prices do not instantly equilibrate any differences between demand and supply. So he thought he'd do an empirical research to find out why, why that might be the case. 
And in Chapter 4 of that book, uh, he went through in great detail uh, the results he got back from uh, manufacturers. And he was he had a bunch of PhD students going out and asking the questions. So these people who knew the theory backwards, who were doing face-to-face mm-hmm. interviews, and the firms that they interviewed involved about 15% of America's manufacturing capacity. So we're not talking a small survey here. And he got the same shocking results, shocking for him. He actually said the overwhelmingly bad news for economic theory here is that the vast majority is output is produced under conditions of constant or falling marginal cost. Now, mm-hmm. that, that is the sort of thing, if you empirically found that very, uh, in a science, you know, a giant gap between what you argue is the theory and what you find is the practical reality, then that would be a, you know, a, a critical anomaly which would ultimately lead to a total change in the theory. It'd be like that's a bit like the black body radiation experiment. Yeah, the, the so-called ultraviolet catastrophe that led classical mechanics to turn into quantum mechanics ultimately. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So you you have something as brilliant as Planck, you know, sitting down and trying to solve that dilemma, and here we go into you know, integration of the complex plane, and he finds the pole, and and then bang, you get your 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 Planck constant comes out of that, and we suddenly pass from a world of continuous energy to discrete quanta. Uh, and that's mm-hmm. that's the sort of dramatic transformation economics should have gone through every time something like this happened. But instead, they would either fudge the result completely or ignore it. And in, in, in Blinder's case, he's got the ignominy of being ignored. If you go onto Amazon and, and look for a copy of Asking About Prices by Alan Blinder, you'll find it's down in the millions of sales. That's not that it's so important because it's out of, you know, relatively out of date these days. But you'll find mm-hmm. there is one review. One review of that book. Guess who wrote the review? You? Yes. <laughs> they, f- they ignored it. They simply ignore stuff that doesn't fit into their framework. And this follows a pattern. I mean, I've listened to uh, all, all of the episodes of your podcast now, which I recommend to anyone listening to this, you can get on Patreon. There are many examples of these empirical realities which are observed and are ignored by the economic theory or assumptions that are simply unrealistic. I mean, the one that I sort of like your critique of a lot is this rational expectation theory. You mm, know, the idea um, that everyone is running around making transactions based on maximizing their own self-interest, uh, whatever that is, um, with perfect knowledge of the situation and the future consequences of their decisions, and so on and so forth, mm, which just yeah. seems fundamentally wrong to anyone who has actually lived as a human. That, that's not, we're not performing these calculations in our heads the whole time. Yeah, and uh, the, yeah, and, and and they'll find ways of covering this stuff, which be, be, because they've bought into a way of thinking about the world, then when there's a flaw uh, pointed out in that, they are very happy to gloss over it and sort of breathe a sigh of relief. They found a way around it, and like it, it, this, this is not quite the rational expectations, but it's a manifestation of that in how they analyze the stock market. So the guy who uh, wrote the core paper for um, the neoclassical theory of, of, of uh, asset markets, which is called the capital asset pricing model, uh, is another so-called Nobel Prize winner called William Sharp. And he did this very carefully. De- you know, I remember reading the paper and seeing there was quite careful logic going forward, starting from the idea that you could actually um, you know, work out your preferences between risk and return. That was an essential part of it. But had an idea of having a, a risk-free rate of, of uh, return you could get if you bought a government bond fundamentally, and then a risky return if you put your money into shares and you therefore, to put it into shares, you had to have expectations of the return for each share and the volatility of that return. Uh, and then he got, so that was a, you know, a theory of how one individual would allocate his or her money uh, between uh, safe and, 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 and speculative assets. But then to jump to the market one, he said, we assume homogeneity, this is a quote, homogeneity investor expectations. Investors are assumed to agree on the prospects of various investments, the expected values, standard deviations, and correlation coefficients described in part two. <laughs> he then, yeah. So he everyone just to, agrees on what stocks are worth. and Yeah, so there's nobody, it, you know, you, you you don't have dinner party conversations about stocks because you all agree with each other. Yeah. <laughs> now, wild. 
and, and he defended that on the basis that, well, you, you have to make simplifying assumptions. But a few years later, in a subsequent paper, he said, he, a book rather, he said what would happen if the assumption was false. And he basically, quote unquote, unquote, he said the theory is in a shambles. They, they treat assumptions which are absolutely critical as if they're simplifying. So if you take mm. the real situation of like Galileo demonstrating the two uh, objects of different mass fall at the same speed, of course, that was inverted commas assuming no air resistance. Now, if you suddenly said, oh, you've assumed no air resistance, well, maybe you could have evacuated a box and done the same thing inside the box. It would have been a much, much more complicated demonstration with exactly the same result or very close to the same result. That's a simplifying assumption. If it's false, you make a much more complicated model but reach much the same conclusions. Okay? They apply this to things where if you thought assumption is false, the theory is completely wrong. It seems like economists have known that this is not the case. So, for example, Keynes, when he was talking about uh, stock prices, referred to it as a beauty contest. Mm. And you have a certain level of, okay, well, that's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, th this this is a physics podcast. And I, I wonder, as I'm sure you agree, and having read your writing, as I study economics, whether a big part of the problem is just that economists have physics envy. I mean, you said that when you talked about the people who came into Sydney University, um, that they felt the subject was too wishy-washy. Mm. And there's this perception that, oh, if you make it more mathematical, uh, then it will somehow be more accurate. Um, well, well, no, it can be more precise um, and it can give you more numerical answers, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's correct if you're making all of these foundational assumptions that are, that are just wrong. And, you know, you often see that they use some of the same assumptions and equations and mathematical formalism that's in physics. Um, but is this giving people a, a false sense of security in the solidity and the accuracy of their predictions. Yeah, well, that's that's fundamentally what's going on. I mean, it certainly did arise out of out of physics envy. And if you go back and read people like Volra and Jevons and, and Fisher, uh, you'll find that they were saying that their, their ambition was to make it into the the social science equivalents of physics. Um, but the physics, if you imagine how much out of date an economist is going to be reading physics, uh, they're going to be certainly back when when you're looking at. Um, uh, Marshall and, and, and Jevons and Volras, you're at least 20 years behind the literature if you're lucky. And uh, mm -hmm. a non-orthodox economist called Phil Murawski had done quite a bit of detailed history of economic thought on that front said that what they were looking at was pre-thermodynamic physics, effectively uh, mechanics, uh, but not statistical mechanics. Uh, mm -hmm. So what they thought they were making, their physics envy was the form of physics which was already, you know, in, in the death throes. Uh, and then mm -hmm. they solidified around that uh, and uh, and they had a whole range of anagrams for physical concepts turning up in economics. You know, conservation of of, uh, of energy became uh, a, almost like a conservation of utility uh, concept, and they got locked into it. And we've actually been trying to think, you know, what what why is it the case that economics does not advance one funeral at a time, which is the case that Planck made about uh, physics when he tried to explain, you know, his Maxwellian colleagues, uh, the, the, the quantum mechanical vision, he said he couldn't persuade anyone, but he said what happens is they die, retire or die, and new mm -hmm. students come along who are comfortable with a new concept. Well, that's because when you have a dilemma like the michelson morley ex experiment or the ultraviolet catastrophe, um, you can't get rid of it and you can reproduce it any time you wish as an experiment to see that it's still there. And even if the professor's themselves are still trying to hang on to the previous system and teaching you the previous way of thinking, uh, they, they, can't, you, they, they can't stop you learning that there's this huge flaw. And if you're a student, your ambition is to solve that problem. So mm -hmm. you get this transition where the old school will you know, cling to the old belief, as, as Planck pointed out, that his Maxwellian uh, physics friends did. Uh, but the new ones know the problem is there. Well, they want to want to solve it, and they end up solving it. And then, when the old ones retire, they're replaced by new ones who who abandoned their theory. And you get quantum mechanics taking over uh, from Maxwell's equations. So that's that's the advantage that physics has. Where in economics, um, you, the the this, for a start, they ignore this stuff. They bury it. So you've got to go read the journals to even find that it happens. You, I know in first year physics, you get you know, the textbooks tell you there's an inconsistency between relativity and uh, and quantum mechanics. So right from you know mm -hmm. page one of a physics uh, textbook, you know there's this dilemma that boy, if you solve that, wow, are you going to be famous? Um, that's yeah. you of, start with what's still unresolved. Yeah, that's right. Economics hides what hasn't been resolved.
And only if you go inside and read the literature can you find that it's not, which is why I wrote Debunking Economics. One sort of aspect of this, I think the, the analogy between physics and economics is really interesting. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad that you've written about it because um, th- there are some specific ways you can interrogate it. So, for example, you talked about thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. One of the classic proofs in physics that we all remember from, from our undergraduate is our deriving the statistical mechanics for how a collection of many, many particles will behave. Mm -hmm. from the kinetic theory of how individual particles behave. And there's an analogy there between the desire to derive macroeconomics, so the economics of whole uh, whole countries, I guess, whole societies and GDP and so on, Mm -hmm. um, from microeconomics, which is the way that individuals might choose to behave. But the, the problem there is that the fundamental entities in physics, the fundamental particles, always obey well-defined physical laws. I mean, they might be complicated and they may give rise to extreme or chaotic and complex behavior when you take them all in aggregate, but the underlying structure is fundamentally mathematical. And I don't think that's necessarily the case with economic units because economic units are people um, in, in the in the non-economist jargon, and we can behave irrationally and not according to simple sort of, we can't, our behavior can't be approximated that well by these fundamental Newtonian uh, laws that we might apply to uh, the individual particles in the kinetic theory that then becomes the statistical mechanics. I mean, do, do you think that this is part of the problem, is trying to link this macroeconomics to the microeconomics? It's, it's part of the problem, but it isn't, isn't, that isn't the only manifestation of it. I think when, one of the articles I quote from physics all the time is, is Philip Anderson's More is Different. And the, the whole point about complexity, meaning that uh, you, when, when you go, you know, aggregates of, 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 of fundamental particles do not, their behavior cannot be in, in any way predicted um, from the from the behaviour, the, extrapolating the behaviour of isolated particles, and like the classic instance I use for my students, there is water. Uh, you can't use the properties of a single molecule of H two O to explain water, or ice, or steam, or sleet, or all the various forms that an aggregation of, of exactly the same particles uh, turns out as behaving. So it's the complexity issue. That's that's the real problem, and mm-hmm. economists pretend that they can extrapolate from the individual forward. So that's where this nonsense about saying like an individual investor, um, we aggregate from one investor, a model of one investor, which, you know, with its own limitations works, uh, to the whole market by presuming all of them have exactly the same expectations. So we treat the entire market as a single investor. And oh, by the way, when they when they finally admitted the theory didn't work, you know, this is, this is from Famer in French, in 2004, Sharp wrote this paper back in 64. So 40 years later, after 40 more years of economic data, um, um, Farmer and French said Sharp uh, added two key assumptions to identify uh, the portfolio. The first assumption is complete agreement on asset returns, and this distribution is the true one. That is, it is the distribution from which the returns we use to test the model are drawn. In other words, we assume people can predict the future. Mm-hmm. Perfectly. Okay? You know, so so this this is this is the sort of nonsense they'll go on with. But it really is this 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 attempt to evade complexity by extrapolating from the micro to the macro, and that's what they do. And of course, by doing it, for they're starting with a model of micro, which itself is shot full of holes, uh, and then they extrapolate that to the macro level, and that's why they don't see things like the global financial crisis coming until after it smacked them in the back of the back of the head. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the interesting thing is it's just so easy to debunk as well. I mean, this idea that people are calculating uh, rationally what they expect things to be worth. When I look at asset price bubbles in something like Bitcoin or so on, mm. I mean, we saw this in the 2008-9 financial crisis as well, that people were buying assets that they actually thought were worthless in the hope that they could sell them on to a greater fool later on. Um, you know, So it's not like there's a rational prediction of the future going on there. It's, uh, it's a speculative and kind of emotion-driven uh, form of gambling, I suppose, that that is driving what people are doing. Yeah, but I, I mean, there's a problem in taking that correction only because, I mean, for, for example, in in the if again, if you read the so-called advanced textbooks, one thing they assume is no Ponzi finance. <laughs> they assume the non-existence. What you just said is obviously a, a characteristic of the real world. But if you that that's what leads to the idea of behavioural economics, and then you have people doing all these tests of the ways in which people's behaviour deviates from. Um, perfect rationality, whether that's defined as a rational person would or the way that neoclassicals define it. But the trouble is when you when you present that fudge to an economist, they say, oh, gee, you, know, you want to aggregate from that to the macro level? That's just not going to work. It's too complicated. You've got you know, 100, different, 100 different ways we deviate from rationality. Let's just assume rationality and keep on going. 
Mm-hmm. And that's what they do. So I, I don't take that tack. I say, look, it's completely wrong to attempt to derive macroeconomics from micro. And I show instead, and I've got a couple of recent uh, papers, which uh, one in the review of political economy uh, in, in last year, two, uh, 2020, which show you can derive macro directly from macroeconomics. So I simply mm-hmm. take macroeconomic definitions like the uh, wage share of GDP, the employment rate and the private debt ratio, and out of that, with very simple, um, you just simply convert them into, into differential equations, whack in the simplest possible behavioral uh, behavior, uh, behavioral rules for workers and capitalists, and what you get is Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. So um, you, you, the whole idea that you have to work from the perspective of the individual is simply wrong. And in many ways, if you look at what physics has done, it's begun at the aggregate level, and then as, as things have gone on further, yes, we're brought in and you've brought in a, a, a individual particle behavior and so on. But often the original work uh, began at the level of aggregates and economics yeah. can do the same thing. And that's that's what I wanted to do. Forget about all this nonsense about going from micro to macro and start working in what matters, which is the macroeconomics. So it's more like an approach where in physics we would talk about if you have gas in a box, which is the classic example, instead of worrying about each individual particle and trying to figure out how that works, just work with bulk quantities like pressure, temperature, yeah, uh, velocity exactly. and all that sort of thing. Exactly, and, uh, yeah. So, I, I mean, I've seen this paper. You, you compare the way the macroeconomy behaves to a more, it ends up being a Lorenz-like uh, dynamic system, uh, yep. which has these inherent instabilities to it. Uh, and, you know, mathematicians and physicists know that you can you can write down quite simple differential equations and systems of them, as, as you've said, which give rise to this sort of chaotic behavior. Um, well, since we're on it, would you like to talk a little bit more about how you think this manifests in, in the macro economy when you try and derive macro economics from itself, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, it's, for anybody who's a physicist, it's going to probably knock this out in a few minutes. But if you, let, let's say you define the, uh, the employment rate as the number of people with a job divided by population. I use L and N for those two terms. The wage share of GDP is total wages uh, uh, divided by GDP. And economists use Y for GDP. I've never actually worked out why they do, but they do. So W over Y. And then the debt ratio, which is private debt, is D divided by uh, by Y again. And you differentiate that and put them in uh, rates of change terms. And you get three um, true, true by definition verbal statements. The employment rate will rise if, if uh, the workforce grows faster than than population, the wages share of GDP will grow if the wages bill grows faster than GDP, and the debt ratio will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. Now then all it takes is a couple of very simple and genuinely simplifying assumptions. Assume a, a constant wage, a, a constant wage, real wage. Um, so you can then divide your W, then big W into, into little W times L. Uh, and then assume that uh, the capacity workers have to demand wage rises depends upon the employment rate and the level of profit that capitalists, uh, the level of investment capitalists wish to undertake depends upon the rate of profit. And then include that when they, they borrow money, they're borrowing to invest uh, in, in excess of their uh, retained earnings. Bang, you've got a very simple uh, three-dimensional model. Again, you said it's very much like Lorenz. It's the same basic story. You don't get complex behavior without a three-dimensional or above system. And what that gives you is what we saw in the real data starting at about 1980, which was a period of diminishing cycles. And this is the pomo manaville uh, intermittent route to chaos turning up. So you have a period of diminishing cycles. You're going from turbulent to laminar flow. And then you go from laminar to turbulent again on the other side. And, and that gives you the, ultimately a, a crisis and a breakdown. And that's exactly what happened uh, as we take a look in the economic data. Uh, so that's where you say the Lorenz equation is quite quick. So we've talked about modern monetary theory on this podcast before, and I know that your work is quite adjacent to that, although you have some disagreements with some of the modern monetary theorists, as is uh, rational in uh, economics. Uh, one of the valuable things that I see for MMT is on the sort of theoretical side, a, a focus on accounting identities that we know must be true, uh, simple mathematics that doesn't have a lot of assumptions to construct it. Um, whereas to get neoclassical economics... Uh, you have to uh, come up with a lot of different assumptions, build a mathematical model that's highly uh, detailed, but contains a bunch of differential equations, which give you the illusion of being certain about what you're working with. Whereas in MMT, you start with simpler equations and you need to apply a little bit more insight and uh, a more sort of social sciences approach, I guess, as to how the macro economy might behave, which I suppose in a way is similar to your 
ideas of uh, deriving the macro economy from itself. And th- mm. that's on the theoretical yeah. side, which I like about MMT. I also think on the practical policy side, their focus on the role of the state to intervene and ensure full employment through actually hiring people and doing fiscal policy is very important, rather than just hoping you can fix everything with monetary policy and setting the perfect interest rate for every situation and letting the free market allocate all of the resources. And you know somehow you'll find this uh, magical monetary policy that is going to uh, succeed in doing whatever you want it to do. And I think even in the mainstream economics now, we're starting to see uh, people from august institutions like the Federal Reserve and so on saying, yeah, actually, we can't rely on monetary policy to do everything as we have been doing in recent decades. And we need the government to step in, uh, particularly in the midst of this crisis and, and start allocating some resources properly. Um, so I wonder if you'd like to talk about the insights that MMT has and uh, the limitations that it has and, and whether you feel that we're getting a bit closer to economic theory that is uh, built on less incorrect foundations, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, the MMT has certainly been extremely important. And the, the thing I've, I've got to you know, take my hat off to the MMT, the people who've lobbied for MMT in the profession, so particularly uh, Warren Mosler, who's a non, non-academic, non uh, who's done, who actually be, be originally introduced the concept that government doesn't uh, tax to spend, it spends to tax. Um, he, uh, uh, Randall, Randall Ray, who uh, was one of Minsky's last eight PhD students, Bill Mitchell in Australia, uh, and then, of course, the one who's much, much more better known these days, Stephanie Kelton, through the deficit myth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then all the, all the people they've, com- they've become sort of acolytes of them around the world. Uh, they've done a brilliant job in getting this concept before the uh, public in general and politicians in particular because uh, nothing since Keynes has broken through the neoclassical orthodoxy. So the fact that it's being even spoken about is an amazing achievement and, you know, I want, I want to do whatever... I, you know, I, I take my hat off to them and I want to do what I can to contribute um, with, with you know, concepts that they, that they don't necessarily have people in their own fields who can develop that I, could, that I can help develop. So it's been extremely important and it does, as you say, start from something which is indisputable and that's the, the laws of accounting as applied to macroeconomics. And if, if, what, what they do is they say that if you are running a deficit, uh, by definition, with respect to you, the rest of the country is running a surplus. So if you spend $100 uh, more than you earn uh, on, uh, on other, other people, uh, then they're, 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 spending, they're spending 100 less in that sense. There's a, well, you're spending as somebody else's income, and that's a fundamental concept in economics, that, of macroeconomics, that expenditure is income because expenditure and, in, and, and, and income are the two ways of looking at the aggregate of the same transactions. Mm-hmm. And then MMT has expanded that and said, well, in that case, if the government runs a deficit, uh, the rest of the country is running a surplus and vice versa. If the government runs, it runs, a, runs a surplus, the rest of the economy runs an identical deficit. Uh, rather than the government saving for a rainy day, it's actually taking money out of people's bank accounts. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the and the objective that they have of running a surplus is is a is a, a part. This is I think you're going to hate me using, so I'm going to delight in using it. It's a partial equilibrium. I hate the word equilibrium in economics. But partial equilibrium approach to a general equilibrium problem. Uh, you have to look at the entire book of balances. You can't just take the government's balance in isolation, and that's what the mainstream does. Uh, so MMT comes along and says, well, if uh, if you're looking at the monetary flows. Uh, then if the government runs a deficit, that's actually injecting money into the economy, far from taking it out of the economy, uh, like in terms of borrowing to cover the deficit. Uh, the government's actually creating money that way and uh, increase, increasing the equity of the non-government sector. So, uh, and then if you look at the, uh, the mathematics that flows from all that, and that's what I built Minsky, uh, my software package Minsky, to do through double-entry bookkeeping, if you look at uh, assets and liabilities in terms of our our claims and other entities in society, so like there are, there are some assets which once you own them, they're yours. You know, if you've got a car and there's no debt attached, then the car is your asset. It's not somebody else's liability. Um, but if I'm looking at you know, assets as claims on other institutions and liabilities as claims other institutions have on you, then assets minus liabilities minus equity at the macro level is zero. Mm-hmm. 
And then that means that you can say, well, if one group, like I say that's the government, is trying to run a surplus, which is what you know, neoclassical economics leads politicians to believe they should do, uh, then that's by definition forcing the non-government sector into deficit. And what you can then show is, well, if that happens, um, the, the group going into deficit tries to find other ways of, of uh, improving its balance and will end up going and gambling and speculating on stock markets and causing stock market bubbles, which then crash and bring you into a depression at a later later stage. And, and that's been what actually has happened in history. Yes. In the 1920s, Calvin Coolidge ran a surplus for a number of years in America, and it was considered to be that mm. the economy was just ticking over. But in, in your re- and, and doing well in the roaring 20s, because mm. the government was able to run this surplus. But in your research, you're sharing that actually, the, the concern is this private debt to GDP ratio. And while the economy was growing, a lot of it was in the form of this private debt bubble. Yeah, yeah. And like, Kulovich was running a 1% of GDP surplus for the whole of the 1920s, pretty much. And he, 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 you know, I think he ceased uh, in 1929. So on comes his successor. And eight months later, <clears throat> you've got the stock market crash. And when you look at what was actually happening, while well, Kulovich was running on average a 1% of GDP surplus, the private sector... Uh, was running on an average of 5% of GDP deficit, borrowing from banks Mm -hmm. uh, for gambling on real estate and some investment and and also, of course, the stock market. And the classic there, which I I was only aware of just recently because I've had the data for ages, but I only realised that I had it and I could check it up on a a database called the Global Financial Database. Level of margin debt in America rose from 1% of GDP in 1920 to 12% of GDP in 1929. And with a, in the 1920s, when you took out a margin loan to go and buy shares, uh, I don't know how people know the mechanics of margin debt, but you, you make a deposit uh, with a stockbroker and the stockbroker then tops it up with borrowed money, which you've got to service the debt, of course. Mm-hmm. But with, back in the 1920s, if you, if you put down $10,000, you could buy $100,000 worth of shares. Uh, but if the shares went up in value by 10%, you doubled your money. But if they went down, you were wiped out. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, so and that's what happens. You so leverage. And it, it literally, when, when the stock market crash hit, the level of leverage was 12% of GDP. Mm-hmm. And that's why that stock market wiped everybody out. Yeah. yeah. The worst we've ever had since then is in the 2000 bubble when it hit 3% of GDP. So that's one reason why the 19, 1930s uh, crash was so much worse than the uh, 2000s and the 2007. So listeners will detect uh, from your accent that you are of Australian origin, obviously, and we've talked about the University of Sydney. The Australian government is one of the ones that is still trying to run a surplus. Isn't that right? Yeah, they are. And and equally, um, not not only the Tories have got that as an ambition, the Labor Party in in the UK is saying we're going to have to balance the books. This is just a completely wrong way of looking at, uh, at the government financial situation. And that's one reason I've built, I said to build Minsky to illustrate this because, I mean, Stephanie Cotton's done a superb job of making this stuff simple to understand and easy to read in the deficit myth, but I wanna add the mathematics to it as well and show, look, uh, there's no problem for the government in financing a deficit. And the, the thing I want people to think about and then trying to understand what to do after COVID is actually the second world war, mm-hmm. because clearly, uh, if the, the level of government spending was a, was a major factor in the fact that you beat the Germans. Now, how much was the deficit in 1939-40? Or 1940, I think it was 40-41. 40% of GDP. Now, where did they find the money? They made the money. This is the whole point of, uh, of MMT and when it comes to government spending. A government deficit creates money. Mm-hmm. Okay, they don't, they don't need to borrow it from anybody. They create it by running a deficit. And what you get in double entry bookkeeping terms is um, the, 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 the deficit is, is shown twice. Once is an increase in the reserves of the banking sector. So the, the banking sector's own bank accounts that the Bank of England got by 40% of GDP. But at the same time, the bank accounts of individuals at private banks also go up by 40% of GDP. And that's what pays for the armaments and the, and the, uh, and the, uh, the, and the army itself. And it's actually... MMT uh, was the reason why you could fight the Germans and win because you could mobilise the unemployed resources from the 1930s and turn into armaments, factories and, and, uh, and military. Uh, so it's exactly the same thing here that you, when you are not, you're not, you are not by running a, a deficit, you are not burdening future generations with a debt repayment problem. You're enriching current generations. Mm-hmm. 
and you're creating the money which is needed uh, to buy the bonds. And, and this, this is the other thing about uh, MMT. Everybody thinks how the government's massively in debt. Well, the government produces bonds to cover its deficit, but the bonds are bought with the reserve side of the money creation process. So the government, by running a deficit, you know, 40% of GDP goes into the liability side of the private banks. 40% of GDP also goes into the asset side. And then the government says, we're going to sell you treasury bonds here. Would you like to buy them? Treasury bonds will give you, say, a 2% rate of interest. Reserves give you zero. Of course, the banks come up and line up to take advantage of that because they're getting, they've already been given the money with which to buy the bonds, buy the deficit. And then they say, well, why don't you take that money, which is earning no interest, and and buy bonds off us and we'll pay you 2% interest. Of course, the banks say, yes, they're going to do it. There's no such thing as bond vigilantes for a country issuing debt in its own currency. Mm -hmm. And this is just money that prints money, so why wouldn't they take it? I mean, the thing that I think is important about MMT is, as you say, this concept that the government's deficit and its uh, ability to create money should be used to mobilize the resources that exist in the economy towards some mm. productive purpose. And, you know, this is the idea behind taxation mm. as a means of provisioning governments. Taxation in a currency requires people to obtain that currency and you effectively make everyone unemployed by levying these taxes. Um, and therefore, you need to spend enough money into the economy to actually, you know, the, the whole point of this cycle uh, is to... Uh, incentivize people to do some particular task that the government wants them to do in order to provision itself. And that's the other, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit critical of that, or, of that interpretation of it, because that implies the economy being be in, fully, in full employment without the government spending. Yes, that's true. And I know that's the belief, and that, so that's, I know that's the belief some of the, some, some elements of MMT have, and I think they're categorically wrong on that front. That's why I built my model of, uh, of Minsky's for starting from pure definitions and show that what I, what I get out of it is cyclical unemployment. Um, if you if you build if you, you know, any any physicist who wants to have a crack at this could probably have a model running in MATLAB in about an hour uh, to show the behaviour of that model and you get cyclical unemployment and you also if you have nonlinear as we obviously do have in the real world nonlinear behavioural elements then your 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 equilibrium is is, is uh, uh, your average is below the equilibrium so you actually have uh, the, the cyclical nature of the economy causes a higher level of, of, of long-run un- unemployment than the non-cyclical. Mm-hmm. So all these things, uh, so, so there's, it, it, it's, it's true. That the point I will accept is that, yes, taxes create a demand for the currency. Equally also, when you look at uh, as in, in the normal commercial relations we have with each other, uh, debt creates a desire for the currency. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of reasons why we want to have money. And the crazy thing about mainstream economics, as you'd be aware from what you've read on it so far, is they assume that money doesn't exist. No, indeed. There's no sort of closed model of how money comes into the system. No, and they, they ridicule anybody who includes money in their models. Uh, and and actually, there was actually, I, I missed it last night because I'm you know, living in Thailand now. Uh, what's a reasonable time in the UK is a pretty bad time for me. Uh, but there was a, a, a seminar with uh, uh, critiquing Q was one of the main textbooks of, uh, of mainstream economics. And he was criticised, Q was actually apparently involved in it, and he was criticised for not including uh, the fact that banks create money in his model. And he had a, a, a really like flippant comment, we don't include people that if people eat ice cream as well, or some stupid comment like that. Mm. Uh, other words saying that this doesn't have any macroeconomic impact. Okay, The fact that banks create money... Uh, which they now have to concede because the Bank of England has told them it's the case, not just a, a, a critics like me, but the Bank of England and the Bundesbank have both said the conventional models are wrong. Uh, but their attitude is, well, it doesn't change the actual macroeconomics, taking it into account, and they're wrong on that. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, what, what, I, what I would say then um, is essentially, regardless of the sort of framing of how, how you look at the uh, unemployment and so on, the, the thing that I think is valuable about MMT is... I find it a more mm. empowering philosophy for um, the state, which, you know, ultimately the state is is supposedly us acting in collective through democratic means uh, to prioritise things and direct uh, what we would like to direct towards something useful. And I think if, if your view is that the state is a sort of parasite that has to come onto the uh, private economy and, and, and extract money from that and isn't really capable of doing anything else, um, then it becomes more difficult to see how that can lead transformation that we need to address climate change. Whereas when you look at it more as a case of, okay, well, we can use deficits to mobilize these resources that exist. That to me is even just philosophically a sort of more empowering way of looking at 
the economy and trying to mobilise economic resources towards solving actual problems. Yeah, we're living, we're living through COVID right now, and that, that is a classic case where you simply can't say, let's let the market solve COVID. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what would happen if the market left to solve COVID? Well, virtually everybody would be bankrupt now because they have no cash flow to cover their outstanding debts. Um, you'd have only people who could afford uh, vaccination would get vaccination, so the disease would be rampant amongst the poor, et cetera, et cetera. So there are, you know, the, the, the neoclassicals generally like to give situations where the government always does things worse than the private sector. But there are some situations, like, for example, a world war uh, or a pandemic, where you simply need to have the government being able to mobilise those resources. And the fact that it has this capability is liberating. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not uh, something which leads to, you know, the, the gulag. But that's the sort of thinking they have about virtually everything. And so one, only, only when you get into a situation like this do you have... Uh, them suddenly conceding, well, yes, we can actually do this. But then when it's when it's behind you, if it is behind you, they'll go back to the same old ideology again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's it's part of the, the problem here is that there's this assumption that economics, you know, settles down to this equilibrium, which is described by the solution to these neoclassical equations and so on. And any interference in that equilibrium is assumed to be bad. And this is the sort of very, mm. um, James Quack called it economism. Because it, it, it's not even necessarily <laughs> economics; it's just a sort of faith in economics, and you'll have. I call it economisery, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what it results in for actual people who have to mm. live on the other end of these theories and their consequences mm. in society. But um, you know, it, it's it's the sort of thing that like a Republican politician will say, "Oh, it's economics one hundred and one. You can't interfere because that just makes the system worse. You have to let the invisible hand um, deal with everything and hope that the uh, hope that the invisible hand is willing to." Um, well, let's not get into that, but um, you have to hope that the invisible hand is uh, willing to do what you want. And I, yeah, it's, it's a very disempowering way of looking at the economy. Um, just before we get on to mm. this climate change, uh, neoclassical economics and how it's particularly had a, a, a very bad impact on the economics of climate change. We've talked about it briefly. You were one of the ones who predicted the 2007-8 financial crisis. You know, when scientists have a crisis, they have a paradigm shift. Um, when mm. economics has a crisis it kind of temporarily throws out neoclassical economics while they respond to the crisis and then return to it later. And uh, we're now seeing a new economic crisis tri- triggered by COVID. And some of the policy tools in place are doing some good things, but others seem like they're inflating bubbles in asset prices and so on. Mm, yeah. do, do you see, uh, I mean, I, I think it's interesting to talk about both what people are trying to do to address this crisis at the moment and also some of the ideas that, that you and other economists have come up with that might be more effective at addressing some of the underlying problems here. Yeah, well, I mean, the classic one that applies now is the, is the overhang of private debt we have after the 2008 crisis. Because again, economic theory completely rules out the importance of private debt on a fallacious foundation of seeing banks as intermediaries in lending. So the, the, model, the mainstream model of banking, uh, first of all, has the government creating money. Uh, the government creates the amount of money by uh, what they call the the money multiplier model, uh, where the government creates a certain amount of money, puts it in people's hands, they go and bank it, the banks hang on to a fraction of that, and then that uh, you get an iterative process that creates the overall level of money. That's the fractional reserve bank uh, model of banking. And then when they look at what the banks actually do, they say, well, banks actually don't don't lend. Banks introduce a saver to a borrower and arrange a a, a um, a loan from one or the other, and they take take out a fee as an intermediary, and that's how they describe themselves in all this stuff. That's totally bonkers, and that's one, one reason I was so glad to have the Bank of England come out and say so in 2014, followed by the Bundesbank, I think, in 2017, saying exactly the same thing. This is a completely wrong model. Banks actually create money when they lend, and they originate debt. They're not intermediaries. They're originators. So that was extremely important. Uh, but it hasn't followed through and in, in, in how they think about overall economic theory. Of course, it's been part of mine for, for decades now. And that means that the level of private debt is an essential element of your capitalist economy because uh, the, the higher level of debt, the more fragile your economy is going to be uh, to any, any downturn in the cash flows that are necessary to service that debt. And the, the higher the rate of change of that debt is, then the more of your aggregate demand is caused by credit. And again, it's crazy, but I'm the only person on the, well, there's two people, myself and Richard Werner, independently work out that credit is part of aggregate demand. Uh, but in, in economic theory, credit has no role in aggregate demand. So in that paper you, we were both talking about from the review of political economy, I prove that <laughs> it's a very simple proof. I prove that credit is part of aggregate demand and aggregate income when you have banks that originate money and debt. 
but that's left out of their thinking, so they don't include the level of private debt. So all the remedies they're suggesting right now for the for the for the COVID crisis are doing sort of the right thing right now, providing a cash flow that people wouldn't otherwise have by government spending. Um, but they're not at all worried about the level of private debt. Now, what what you're seeing when you look at the level of private debt right now, because people are being forced to borrow not just for investment now or speculation, but simply to have the cash flow to to avoid going bankrupt, there's been an enormous explosion in the level of private debt. It's risen in America's case. Uh, private debt peaked at 170 percent of GDP in about 2009, fell down to 150 percent. Uh, in the aftermath, which is still three times the level of private debt that we had at the beginning of the, the post-World World War II period. Uh, but then when COVID hit, it's gone from 150 to 162 percent in the middle of last year. It hasn't. We haven't got data past um, past June yet, and it's already it rose by 12 percent of GDP in one year. Now the rise in government debt's bigger still, but of course that's just the government creating money which the government's got no limits in the capacity to do that. They're ignoring the private debt. They're worrying about the government debt. When we get to the stage where, the, if we get to the stage where COVID is behind us and we don't have an immediate climate change replacement, uh, then if in, in, that, in that lull, uh, what they're going to do is obsess about reducing the level of government debt when private debt would be risen by 20 or 30% of GDP, well under crisis levels, people are going to go bankrupt like crazy, we'll have a financial crisis. So they're, they're, because, they're, they're, because their mindset tells them not to even look at this data they collect on private debt, um, the, the remedies now are functional, but in the aftermath, they're likely to make the crisis worse. And so instead, you would advocate for something like a debt jubilee, uh, which is something like Michael Hudson mm. has talked about as well. And that, what, what, sort of how would that work and what, what form do you think it would take? Well, I mean, technically speaking, it'd be very simple to do because just as a, a government deficit creates money, so would a, a, a jubilee where the government gave everybody an equal amount of money. Like an example I use in America... Uh, is give everybody who's got a bank account a hundred thousand dollars, and but but require them that if they have debt, they must pay their debt down by that hundred thousand. If they don't have debt, or well, you know, the, the the excess, um, they have to buy shares, which are newly issued shares by the corporate sector that must be used to pay down corporate debt. And if you you do that, uh, you would you could reduce the level of of private debt in America from one hundred and seventy percent of GDP down to seventy percent. Uh, which puts it in the relatively safe zone. Uh, and all, all you would be doing is effectively accounting entries between the government, the central bank and the treasury. And the, 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 bond, the, the, the money to create it, would be, the money to finance the Jubilee would be, would be done by the, created by the Jubilee itself. And then if you sold bonds to finance it, the bonds would be bought by the financial sector using the uh, money created on the, on the asset side of their books by the Jubilee. And you, that would then mean that the banks would be losing income they currently get from people paying their interest on the level of private debt, but replacing it with interest the government's creating on the debt to finance the Jubilee, the bonds that finance the Jubilee. Um, and the banks would get an income flow, even though they'd lost the income flow they got from the private sector. And that would return us to some extent to the world of the, the 50s when you used to have this joke, I think it was called the 363 rule, that determined how how the banking sector behaved back in the days when Jimmy Stewart was a good example of the bank of a bank manager rather <laughs> it's than it's a wonderful life, uh, yeah. rather rather than the wolf, wolf on Wall Street and um, they said you, know, you 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 borrow at three lend at six and get on the golf course by three o'clock and that'd be a much better use of the time of bankers than what they're doing right now. A return to boring banking and one that is slightly less motivated by all of this. We need we need boring banking and exciting engineers. Mm. That's what we need. Uh, so it, it's it's quite doable. It is an accounting operation. Uh, there, there'd be complexities thrown in by the fact that there are all sorts of caveats and, and you know co codicils on debt uh, contracts about paying money off pretty rapidly and so on. But you could use the force majeure argument to get around those, or you, you know, it'd be complicated, but it could be done. But you could just use the capacity of the government to create money to reduce the level of uh, private debt by 100% of GDP uh, virtually overnight. And then you'd reduce the, re reduce the debt burden on individuals. You'd make individuals feel freer about spending themselves. So you'd, you'd get a boost out of increased turnover of existing money. Uh, out of something like a jubilee, the banks would be getting would 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 not be sent bankrupt by the whole process. Nobody in debt, the, the, the pe people who to whom debt is owed would not lose money. 
Um, so all these things people normally worry about could be circumvented by a well-designed jubilee. Mm-hmm. And I think part of the concern here, I mean, it, it's it's another sort of line of reasoning that you've taken that I think is very uh, clear to people who aren't that well versed in economics, or at least was clear to me, is the idea that you, in some ways you have three groups of people, right? You have the workers, you have the capitalists, and you have the financiers. And it's actually the financial mm. sector that we want to rein in. The capitalists who are doing productive investment in things that actually increase uh, the production capacity in the real economy, that's not necessarily the problem. The problem is with people who are just trying to do M, M prime, you know, and make more money out of the money that they have through speculation. Mm. And part of this debt jubilee idea is this sort of reissuance of shares. And I think that, that it's an interesting idea to talk about how we could try and return the share market to doing what it was originally intended to do, which is to direct people's uh, money, which is idle or looking for a return, mm. into actually investing in stuff that genuinely does increase the productive capacity and does provide useful uh, goods or services to some people somewhere, rather than all of this kind of speculation and asset bubbles and so on, where the money is ultimately not necessarily being directed into uh, physically solving the problems that exist in the world. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, this is the, the, we've got a Rontier version of capitalism and uh, and, and and Michael Hudson covers that brilliantly. Um, so you, you 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 have economic theories actually come out supporting the Rontiers. When if you go back and look at Smith and Ricardo, uh, and you know, I've got my criticisms of both of those. But one of the main things they wanted to do is reduce the load that Rontiers and landlords have on the society and provide more of the money to capitalists to enable more investment and innovation to take place. Uh, but instead, what neoclassical economics has done is strengthened the Rontiers actually told us to ignore them, don't worry about them, they don't matter, when in fact they're, the, they're this like saying, don't worry about that growth on your nose, it's really, you know. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> you look good with a cancer on your nose mm. uh, and, it, and, it, and it, it's, it's letting parasitic behaviour take over the system. So it's ended up being an anti-capitalist ideology in charge of capitalism. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because a lot of people will come to this straight away and say, okay, well, the problem is capitalism per se. And mm. in, in many ways, a lot of what they're criticizing is this rentier aspect of capitalism, which takes money, makes more money, and doesn't really do that much productive with the, the resources that are ending up concentrated in prototypical top percent, one percent of people. Yeah, I mean, there's, and again, like if you look at uh, capitalism as a social system and say what distinguishes it from any previous system, uh, and the, the basic answer there is, uh, and it's also, of course, it's time, and this is going to, when we start talking about um, uh, energy. It's it's tied with the energy issues as well. But capitalism encourages innovation, and it can discourage as well. You know, monopolies, blah blah blah, patents, and so on and so forth. But the major advantage it has is that it it, it gives a, st- a strong incentive to to incent- to um, innovation, and that is a destabilizing force. But that's a good form of instability. But you want your innovation being done in the man- in the physical economy, the the service sector, the manufacturing sector, not in the financial financial world and instead what we've ended up with is a is a, a view of, of, of capitalism that has given a cover to all the innovation being about you know, Ponzi schemes mm-hmm. rather than producing real wealth. And this is the again the advantage of, uh, of an MMT approach to things is purely just to redirect some of those assets and some of those people towards doing something useful. So thank you for listening to this episode of Physical Attraction and thank you to Steve Keane for being so generous with his time and agreeing to be interviewed. You can find Steve on Patreon at patreon.com slash prof Steve Keen, where you will have access to a good number of podcasts and posts on economics for free, and where you can subscribe for further access to more shows. He's also on Twitter at prof Steve Keen, where you can keep up with the latest news on his work. You can find our show online at physicspodcast.com. There you'll find the episode list on the about page where you can find all of the episodes we've done on subjects ranging from the birth of stars to the end of the world and everything in between and the episodes on the ongoing Climate 201 where we talk about the science, economics and policy of climate change in much more depth, along with all of the different interviews that we've done with various figures over the years. There you can also get in touch with me with any comments, questions or concerns you might have about the episodes through the contact form, and you'll also find links to support the show on PayPal for a one-time donation, or Patreon for longer-term subscriptions and access to bonus content. Thanks very much to everyone who has supported the show already. Until next time then, please do take care.